Let's open up in a word of prayer and very specifically pray for these two dear people. Lord, I thank you that you hear our prayers. And, um, and I, I, I thank you, God, that we can ask and we can seek and, and we can knock. And so we come asking, seeking, and knocking this morning, asking, oh God, for you to intervene. And, and spe especially in Mary Sue's life, I pray for healing of this retina. And, and I pray, God, that, that you would give her complete healing um, so that she can uh, get on with her life and, 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 and especially to be there for her family and, um, and to be able to get back to work. I know uh, she loves and is good at what she does and so dependent on her eyes. I pray, Father, for Danny right now and, and his family and, and this situation that, God, that you would uh, bring healing uh, and strength to his lungs to be able to breathe on his own. And, Father, I pray that his family uh, would feel your presence right now, Lord. Dear God, as we, uh, we, and we put that into your hands and ask for your will to be done, but, Lord, our desire is, is for you to heal in both of these situations. Lord, I, I pray as we open your word up and study the life of Abraham that you would help us to remember this was a real man who lived in a real point in history, who had uh, struggles and battles and failures. Uh, but God, you used him to build your nation. You used him as the founder of Israel and the forefather of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I pray that your word would be real to us this morning, and that you would uh, deal with us in an area in the area of commitment today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the Word of God, it, at the end of the day, is ultimately about God. All right? In the beginning, God. Right? And, and there's an error that we make at times um, trying to find ourselves in Scripture. And always reading Scripture to... Um, I don't know how to put this, but to kind of treat it like a self-help book, right? I, it's going to help me here and help me there, and, and it will help us. Just stay with me. Um, but ultimately, Scripture's about God. It's about His plan. It's about His work. It's about His holiness. It's about how He has intervened in history and in the lives of human beings to bring us to salvation, so it's all about God, but at the same time, it is about our response to God. So it is about us. And the difference between it being a self-help book and it being about God and our response to Him is that we view it as a book about God and about His works and about where we fit into that. And so again... Um, we have to be careful not to just read it as a self-help book and pull verses out of context and try to make them apply to us where they may not. Um, but at the same time, it is about our response to God. You know, in salvation, uh, we believe and Scripture teaches that salvation is not by good works or religious practices that we do. It's all about what God did for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and how his life on earth, he, was, he kept the great commandment every moment of his life. He loved God the Father with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength 24-7 his entire life. He always loved his neighbor as himself, even when he was calling them out for their hypocrisy or whatever. In other words, Jesus lived a life that you and I cannot live. He lived the perfect life, always pleasing the Father, always loving his neighbor. Yet at the end of his life, when he died on the cross, he became guilty for our sins in those hours on the cross. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, He became sin for us, he who knew no sin, so that we through him might become the righteousness of God. And so... The salvation is about God and His work, but it's also about our response to that in faith. Once a person is saved, God gives us the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, to convict us, to 
illuminate the meaning of Scripture to guide us, to uh, give us victory over sins, we must appropriate the work that He does in our lives in order to have victory. God's given us the Word of God, and the Bible does say it's living, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And all of the, the, the beauty of Scripture we have, but we have to take that and do with it, read it, study it, apply it, meditate on it. The point is, Scripture is all about God, but it's also about our response to God, and we're responsible for that. We're going to study Abraham over the next several probably till sometime in March. I have about eight messages or nine messages that I'm working on in his life, and we're going to have missions conference coming up next month, and there will be a couple of different things that, that prolong this, but we're going to talk about Abraham. Now, just as a side note here, I'm going to use Abram and Abraham, Sarai and Sarah interchangeably for the first few weeks, because if you read his life, you'll know he was called Abram. She was called Sarai in the beginning, but then in Genesis 17, their names were changed to Abraham and Sarah, and we'll talk about that as time goes on. So if you hear me using that interchangeably, um, and as I, as I do from time to time, I may call him uh, Joseph one week. It, it's Abraham. All right, if I use the wrong name, one time I preached about Joshua, and the entire message I called him Joseph. And Anita said after the message, honey, you called him Joseph the whole time. And uh, everybody knew it except me. But Abraham and Sarah. <clears throat> so we're going to go through his life, and we're going to watch how God worked and how Abraham responded to God's work in his life. Now, before I read the passage in Genesis 11 and 12, I want to read two verses out of Joshua 24 where we studied a few weeks ago, on December 31st to be exact. <clears throat> and Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor. Look at this. And they served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, verse 3, then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan. So Genesis 24 is a speech that Joshua gives to the children of Israel. And uh, in this speech, he begins with a history of the nation of Israel, starting with Abraham. And he explains how God had worked through the forefathers um, from Abraham to where they were at in the promised land there at the end of the book of Joshua. Joshua reminds them that their patriarch, Abraham, had actually immigrated from uh, beyond the Euphrates River, what we would call the Fertile Crescent or Mesopotamia. He had immigrated to uh, Canaan or the land of Israel, what they were calling the promised land. Abraham and his people uh, were idol worshipers. Joshua says right there in the end of verse 2, and they served other gods. This was Abraham. So just in a way of introduction, the first thing I want to say about Abraham, he and his family were idolatrous. Verse 2 ends, and they served other gods. Now it's easy to read past that. And I, I've said that phrase a lot over the last several weeks. And the reason I've been saying that is because we do that. I do that. You read a passage of Scripture, you read a phrase, they served other gods, and you keep going, and you don't actually think about that. What does it mean that Abraham and his forefathers served other gods? The primary god worshipped in that area was the moon god. Um, actually, his name was Sin, S-I-N. Um, in that language. This worship of the moon god would have involved all kinds of pagan perversion and child sacrifice and demonic practices. 
This is Terah, Abraham, and his brothers. What's remarkable, about, uh, what's remarkable is that Abraham lived around 500 years after the flood. If you look at a timeline, uh, some of Noah's sons could have still been alive during Abram's life. And we know that at the end of the flood, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives knew Jehovah God. Right? They had just seen the flood, worldwide flood. The world's wiped out. They saw the judgment of God. They knew there was only one God. And 500 years later, which is a long time for us, but in the scheme of things, 500 years is not that long. In 500 years, humans had strayed from worshiping one God to worshiping a multitude of idols and gods. So it's what Genesis chapter 11, 1 through 9, and the Tower of Babel is all about. It shows how quickly humans devolved. I don't believe in evolution. I do believe in devolution. We always devolve. We don't get better. But it shows how quickly humans went from worshiping God to worshiping smaller G gods. In fact, it's what Paul wrote in Romans 1.25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature. I put in parentheses the created thing rather than the creator. This is the history of the world. This is world history in one Bible verse. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the created thing rather than the creator. That, that's it. I listened to an interview um, uh, by, about, with Sam Harris a few days ago. Well, a couple of weeks ago. If you know, he's one of the famous uh, atheists... Uh, and uh, sort of, um, you know, he's got his style, and, and um, he's wrote a book, A Letter to a Christian Nation. Uh, he's written other books to try to cause people to doubt their faith. And, and I listen to him. I want to hear what he says. In this, in this interview, he said, I would believe in God if he would just do something to show us that he's out there. And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. He did. <laughs> he did. The creation points to a creator. And we can debate the age of the earth and all of those things. That's, but uh, where there's a creation, there has to be a creator. Where there's design, there has to be a designer. And, uh, and so, but as, 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 as a human race, we have always strayed from God. <clears throat> I put it this way in my notes, on our own, Without an intervention from God, we will always stray away from God. In today's world, that God may not be worshiping the moon. It may not be fashioning an idol and bowing down and, and somehow thinking that that idol is going to uh, work in your life. In the world today, it may be humanism. Sort of a, what Sam Harris worships. It's, it's a worship of human intellect and human ability and, and, and belief that uh, the answers to all the world's problems are found in human ability, human intellect, human logic. That God may be materialism, believing that any emptiness I have in my life will be filled with materialism or wealth or you name it. That God may be hedonism, a belief that any need that I have and any emptiness I have can be filled through hedonism, through um, sexual immorality, or through drugs, alcohol, and uh, that type of lifestyle. That God may be power, right? We've got a whole city in our country with people who worship the God of power, and they want our votes every four years or every two years. That God may be prestige, Hollywood's made up of people who worship prestige, and they live for that. That power may be, that God, I mean, may be religion. All over the world, even in religions that classify themselves as Christian, many of people do not worship God, they worship the religious practices instead of God. The point is, 
We will always, as human beings, exchange the truth for a lie, and we will always follow false gods instead of the true God when left to ourselves and to our own devices. This is biblical truth. It's a historical truth. It's a theological truth. And it really, the Word of God is a history of human beings doing that very thing. It's what we call the sin nature. It's what we call total depravity. So Abraham and his family were idol worshipers. The second thing, and this is just an introduction, God intervened. Over in Joshua 24, 2 and 3, verse 2 ends, and they served other gods. And then verse 3 said, God is speaking here. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan. Do you see that? God intervened in Abraham's life. They were serving other gods. He had his practices, his beliefs, his religion. Then God intervened in Abram's life and took him. You understand, Scripture never explains to us uh, and never tells us that Abram did something to stand out for God to say, I'm going to pick Abraham. He didn't. In fact, God said in Joshua 2, they served other gods. Then I took your father, Abraham. God intervened in Abraham's life. It was... God's intervention, there was no effort, no change, or no merit on Abraham's side. It was all God working directly in Abraham's life. By the way, did you know this is scriptural? We go all through scripture and find this principle. Jesus said in John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now what does that say? No one can come to Jesus, unless God does a work in the life of that person to draw that person to God. No one ever wakes up one day on their own and thinks, hmm, I think I'll seek after God. I think I'll, I'll go search for God. Paul actually wrote in Romans 3, 10 and 11, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. Again, that's a biblical principle. We could spend a week uh, of Sundays studying that. Without God intervening in your life or my life, you cannot be saved. You cannot seek after God. It was that way for Abram, and it's been that way ever since human history. What did Adam and Eve try to do after they sinned? They tried to run and hide. What did God do? God intervened. And, and that story goes on. If God does not intervene in your life or mine, at some point we are hopelessly lost in our sins. And I believe he does intervene. Okay, I'm not up here teaching Calvinism. Uh, what I'm teaching is what Scripture teaches. God intervenes. It may be in the form of a, a brother or sister who offer you a tract or share the gospel, or it may be because you were brought up in church, children's church or whatnot, and at some point in that, God intervened in your life. But the point is, if God does not intervene, we are hopelessly lost. Now, I want to... So that's the story of Abram's life. That's how we get to Genesis 12. And um, that's his background. He was an idol worshiper probably child sacrificer. And we'll get to Isaac and that, um, that episode in a couple of weeks. But I want to go back to Genesis chapter 11, and let's just read about Abraham and his family. Verse 27, now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Now, by the way, Terah probably had multiple wives and a bunch of kids. These are the three that God specifically mentions for us. Verse 28, Haran or Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now Ur is in what we would consider modern day Iraq. It's on the side of the Euphrates River. It's what was known in history class as the Fertile Crescent or Mesopotamia. That's where Abraham and his family came from. 
verse 29. And Abram and Nahor took wives. Okay, two of the brothers got married. One of the brothers died. <clears throat> the name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child, just a little rabbit trail, because we have extra time this morning. Um, barrenness is a theme all through Scripture. It's an interesting study. Um, Sarah was barren until she had Isaac. Uh, Isaac's wife, Rebecca, was barren for a time until God gave her the ability to have Esau and Jacob. Jacob's wife, uh, Rachel, was barren for a time. Samson's mother was barren. Uh, Samuel the prophet, his mother was barren. John the Baptist's mother was barren. There's a, a theme through Scripture where God intervened miraculously in the life of these women, allowing them to conceive. Just a little sidetrack. Verse 31. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. Now, this is interesting. If you look at a map, they would have headed northwest and then west, and they would have parked in Haran. Haran's in southeastern Turkey. Um, when I was in the military, I've been there. It's a place. And uh, there's monument there that Abraham and his family used to live there. And um, it's just north of Syria. But that's where they settled, okay? God had called Abraham to leave his land. He left with his father, with uh, his nephew Lot. And they were on their way to Canaan, to the promised land as we know it. And they stopped in Haran about halfway there and they settled down. They were there for a while. Verse 32, the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, um, because of the nature of the Hebrew language and the past tense, some versions say, now the Lord had said to Abram. Okay? So the point is the Lord had said at some point in the past to Abram, go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Abram kind of obeyed in two different time periods. Um, but, he, but he obeyed, as we'll see. Verse 2, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We talked about that on the Sunday before Christmas and on Christmas Eve. And I don't know if we're going to dig back into those verses, at least not in the next week or so. But go to verse 4. So Abraham or Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. So here we have Abraham and his family, idol worshippers, God intervenes in his life at some point, and, and Abraham becomes a believer in Jehovah God. God calls Abraham to leave his, his, his country, his family, to go to another place. Now, I'm always real careful here. I've heard, you know, it's easy as a preacher to, to take and try to put us, or put Abraham in our place, and... Um, you know, they bring the idea of you selling your house and packing your goods up in a U-Haul van to go to somewhere where God may or may not show you. Well, Abram, that, that whole world were at least semi-nomadic to begin with. So they did normally live a life of, of seasonal um, changes, living in this area because there was rain and there was pasture for their sheep and their goats. And then when the weather patterns changed, they would move to another area and moved around. So they were already semi-nomadic um, within their own land. But God called Abram 
to leave that and to go to another land. And what I want to do for us is I want to look at the call to commitment for Abram. And I want to make personal application for us with this. And our goal is always is to understand Scripture as it was written, as the original readers would have understood it, and then make a, an appropriate application for our lives. And, and I emphasize that because, again, it's amazing what you hear come out of different Bible uh, histories, David and Goliath, and they turn Goliath into whatever the next problem you're going to face in your life is your Goliath, and they twist Scripture to say something God never intended for it to say. So we want to make appropriate applications here. But let's look at the call to commitment for Abraham in verse 1 and verse 4. I put them together. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. <clears throat> in verse 4, So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And I put there as I was thinking about that, Abram was called to leave something secure to go to something that was uncertain. That's what God called Abram to do. Now, I want to notice an order in verse 1, as you'll see it up there. God called Abraham, he specifically said, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. So a couple of things. Our, our, our theme and application that I want, to, want us to think about this morning is this was Abram's go-from moment. And I believe every one of us in our life will have a go-from moment that God brings into our life. And in this go-from moment, God called Abram to leave country, relatives, close family. The stakes are higher with each of these relationships. Abraham, you are to go from your country. And you are to go from your relatives. And you are to go from your father's house. The stakes were higher. The sacrifice was greater with each of these thoughts. And that had to enter into his thinking and into his decision-making. Think about his country. As I already said, they were semi-nomadic. They understood the climate. They understood the, the, the language, the food, the culture where they were living. Abram had neighbors. He had a way of life. And God called him to leave that. Abram, I want you to go from your country. It was a commitment that required Abraham to put God's will over Abram's love for where he lived, his home, and his culture. Then God had Abraham go from his kindred, his relatives. Now, in that day, they would have been tribal, right? They were kind of like rednecks um, today where the whole family lives in the same trailer park or wherever. And um, that's how they lived. They were tribal. So the, his... Um, sort of tribe or village would have been made up mostly of family and extended family and those outside of the family that had married into the family. And um, it, it reminds me one time when we were living in the jungle in the same type of situation, we had a, a, a girl who had a, a, an in, infection and, and she was really sick and, and, and so uh, we called a plane in uh, to, to, to take her out to get her help and we were new there and didn't know a lot of people. And I asked somebody, I said, does she have any relatives here? And the guy who spoke Spanish, so we didn't know the Indian language yet, and he laughed, he chuckled and said, we're all family here. And um, that's what Abram's um, tribe would have looked like. They're all related in one way or another. But God, God called him to leave it. Go from your kindred. God required Abram to choose between God and obeying God and his relatives. God called Abram to choose between God and the familiar things and the familiar relationships that he had. And he said, go from. Go from your country. Go from your kindred. 
Finally, God called Abram to leave his father's house. Now, we know that Terah and Lot traveled with Abram to Haran, and then at some point, Abram left Haran, and he took Lot with him. <clears throat> Not sure if that was incomplete obedience. Scripture never goes into that detail. <clears throat> but God called him to go from his father and his family. The closest relationships that Abram had in his life, the people he loved the most, God said, I want you to go from them and to leave them. This was, these were the things that gave Abram his identity. These were the things that gave Abraham his security. You know, it's interesting, when I go back home, I've not lived in Panama City, Florida in a long time. That's where I come from. And, and both of my grandparents and my great-grandparents are from there. You don't find a lot of Floridians that go back to the late 1800s, but our family does. But I go back home, and, and I automatically, even though I've not lived there I, in years and years, I feel a sense of security. I run into people I know. I know, well, that's where my cousin lives, and that's the house my grandparents used to live in. And that was the world of, of Abraham, and God called him to leave that. His day-to-day -day friends and habits and routines, the people that would have had his back if there was a problem, come up. God called Abraham to go from all of that to an unfamiliar place. We're not going to go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 talks about it and commends Abraham for his faith. It says, Abraham, by faith, left all of the things that we just mentioned. This was going to take Abram from his comfort zone and take him out of his comfort zone to another place that he did not know about. This commitment required Abraham to leave everything he knew to go to a place that God would eventually show him. And I believe with all of my heart that every believer will have a time in their life when God will bring them to this type of commitment. To what I'm going to call a go-from commitment. Every one of us, every one of us uh, will come to that moment. And, and I know for several reasons, and, and we'll see those in a minute. The, the week I got saved in 1985, and I've shared my testimony, and, and I'm not going to share my testimony, but I, I, I trusted the Lord on a Monday night at youth camp that year over in Brevard at the Wilds. <clears throat> and, uh, and I trusted the Lord. And Thursday night of that same week, I committed to, I yielded my life to the Lord. I don't, I mean, I don't think in those days I had started to stray, but it was like in a message, God spoke to my heart and, and brought me to a point to, to yield my life to whatever God wanted for me. Uh, since then, there have been many of these occasions, these go from moments. And as we saw in Abram's life, and we're going to see a couple of these as we go through Abram's life, he was called from everything familiar to a place that he did not know. Now I want to clarify as I, we make application with this and, 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 and wrap this up in a few minutes. For many people, this will never result in a change of geography like Abram. All right, so I want you to understand, when I'm saying go from, I'm not saying that every one of you needs to move to a different part of the country or a different country. Um, in the case of Abram, it was part of that. In, in my life, it, it resulted in that, it, but it may not. The, the go from is, is a call of God uh, to us to be surrendered. That's what it's about. It's a heart call. It's God speaking to our lives and bringing into clarity all of our priorities, all of the things that we love, and he's putting those up against us and saying, choose, make a choice. God will call us to surrender our past, our security. He will call us to surrender our comfort zone, our family, our friends. And again, you might live your entire life in Davidson County, but that doesn't change the importance of those go-from moments 
that God brings into your life. I believe we'll all have a Genesis 12-1 moment. We will be brought face to face with God's will versus our will. We'll be brought face to face with God's plans versus our plans. We'll be brought face to face with our desires versus God's desires. The things we cherish versus what God cherishes. By the way, this theme is found throughout Scripture. We could spend a long time studying. I'm just going to mention a handful of verses. Just a few weeks ago, Joshua, uh, December 31st, and Joshua 24, 15, Joshua challenged the people of Israel to make this decision. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And he went through the gods of the other lands, or Jehovah God, and Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This was a go-from moment for those people. This was the same as what happened to Abram in Genesis 12.1. Joshua brought the decision out front and clear to the people. He wanted them to recognize there's a decision that you have to make. You must choose God or your God's. Isaiah had that moment in Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This was his go from moment. Jesus taught this several times in Scripture. Matthew 6, 33, Jesus told the disciples, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He was putting it out there to the disciples. This is your go from moment. You're either going to make God's kingdom and His righteousness the priority of your life, or you're going to make these things, these other things that Matthew 6 speaks about, the priority of your life. In Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow Me. Again, a go-from moment. Here's a decision. He was reminding the disciples that if they were going to follow him as true disciples, they had to make the decision to deny themselves, right? Their, their, their priorities, their gods, their, their loves. They had to take up his cross and follow him. In Luke 14, 26, Jesus said these difficult words to read. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Several months ago on a Wednesday night when we were studying principles of biblical interpretation, we took a look at this verse. And we recognize that God's not commanding us to sin by hating people. We know that the, the point here is God's call to us to follow him may appear to be hate, to someone on the outside. We've got a young man that our church loves that just is on his way to Dominican Republic. And if you're on the outside and you don't know God and you don't know the Word of God and you don't understand this type of commitment, you would think, well, who would leave his family to go live in another country? Who would leave his mom and dad and grandparents and great-grandparents that all live? Why would he do that? Why would he treat them that way? Right? The world may view Levi Gates' commitment as a hatred of his family, but Levi had his go-from moment, and God said, Levi, I want you to go from Midway in Davidson County and go to New York to study the Word of God, and I want you to go from New York to Dominican Republic. And he yielded in that go-from moment. You know, Jesus, and I don't have this verse written down, Jesus had his go-from moment. Now, we know Jesus was perfect. He never sinned. But do you remember the night before Jesus died on the cross, he was praying in the Garden of Eden. The reality of what was getting ready to happen was weighing down on him. And he said, Lord, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, please let it pass. And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That was sort of his go-from moment. He yielded. He was obviously always yielded, but even in those moments, as the perfect human being, the perfect God-man, he had to yield to God's will. The Apostle Paul admonished the Christians in Rome, 
Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, as a living sacrifice to God. Again, this is our go from moment. Every one of these verses, and there are many more, takes us to a go from decision in our lives. Now, I believe most of us will have several of these pivotal decisions that we make. We come to wise in the road. We have moments in our lives where God brings us to a place of decision and He requires us to decide, are we going to yield our entire lives to Him or are we going to take our own path? Now, there are several reasons for this. We go through different life stages that require different commitments. I believe for one, uh, one of the reasons we have many of these is Romans 12, 1 calls us a living sacrifice. Okay, as a living sacrifice, we can get up and walk off the altar, right? We can make that decision with a heart of, that's sincere and we're truly yielded to God, and then through circumstances in life and life, in time, we wander away from that and we find ourselves living back in the world of our desires and our plans and our dreams and we allow God's to go by the wayside. And so I do believe we have these go-from moments in our lives. But my desire this morning is to bring all of us to a go-from moment. Now, only God can do this in your heart. And you can hear this sincerely and in your head and chew on it and think about it and, 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 and move on with it. Um, but my prayer is that God will bring us all to, to face-to-face with this type of decision and, and, and lead us to be committed. I don't care what point, whether you're a young person, a teenager, or whether you're in the later years of your life. Abraham was 75 when God brought him to that moment. I want us to uh, be a people in a church where we're yielded to God, where we're truly, truly willing to sell it and get rid of it and move to a specific place if that's what God called us to do. Again, He don't usually call people in that way or, or the majority of us. People, we need folks to hold the fort down and to, to, to be a part of the local churches. But we need to be willing. And I think in a, in a church like ours where there's a history and, and many of us have been believers for many years, it's easy to stray and to wonder and to leave those commitments that we had made at an earlier point in our lives. And I think we need to be brought back to a go-from moment where we truly from our heart make the decision, God, I'm going to be yielded to you and I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do at this life stage that I'm at. And that may look different if you're 80 than if you're 18. And I understand. You may be here this morning and you actually never have yielded your life to God. Either in salvation to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior or as a child of God, you've never said, God, I'm I'm willing. I'm willing to yield my life to you. I want you to be my God, and I want to give up the gods that I have. You've never yielded your business or your finances to God, your plans or dreams to God. You've never said like Isaiah, here am I, send me. You've never truly said in your heart and out loud to God like Joshua, as for me and my house, We're going to serve the Lord. You've never truly taken up your cross and followed Jesus. And so I want to challenge us this morning to ask God to lead you to a go-from commitment and a go-from decision and be yielded to God, be committed to God this year, this week, this day, and ask God to help you to live in that yieldedness every day and week and month and year of your life moving forward. When we choose anything over a commitment to God, we're choosing our God. And so let's take a look at Abram's life 
Roll out Genesis 12, 1. God came to Abram and said, Abram, I want you to go from, and that required a commitment to put God over every area of his life. And I want to challenge you this morning to do that, to make that decision, to get back to living in that decision. If as many, I've, I struggle with it like you do. I know what it, I mean, I'm up here preaching to myself. We, 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 we stray. And I just want to challenge you this morning. We're going to pray. Take time to pray in your, in your place. If you need to come to the altar, as David leads us in a song, choose God, yield your life to God, and truly be willing in every part of your life to serve God, David. There's just some problems only God can fix. All of my trials wore me down to I've seen it happen time and time again. There's just some problems only God can fix. And there's just some battles flesh and blood can win. There'll be some moments that just don't make sense. Can't see it now. I'm still convinced that there's just some problems only God can fix. And we sing, not by power, not by might, by the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God, not my by the spirit of the living spirit of the living God and I've seen a breakthrough that I can't explain I found a healing hidden in my pain. I know a dead man that once robbed the grave. And I've seen a breakthrough, and I will again. And it's not by power, not by might, by My refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. My helper, defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Oh, oh, oh. someone let the people know anything is possible. No weapon will prosper, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. My fortress, my refuge, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. My helper, defender, still a strong tower, still a strong tower. Oh, someone let the people know anything is possible. No weapon will prosper, still a strong tower, still a strong tower, not by not by might, but by the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God. Not my battle, not my fight, by the Spirit of the living, Spirit of the living God.
dear God, uh, we come before you now, and we're just so thankful for uh, everything you do, but we're especially thankful for the spirit that we have uh, inside of us from you, if we have a relationship with you, and we're just so thankful for the uh, promise of that, and as we uh, go throughout our week and this year, Lord, just let us, let us truly be led by the spirit uh, through your word, and just uh, how we can make that apply to our lives this week, and uh, we're just so thankful for everything you do for us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.